You're listening to the Inner Field Trip Podcast, designed to help highly sensitive people and deep feelers explore unconscious biases so they protect their energy, stand on the side of justice, and become better ancestors. My name is Lisa Renee Hall, your host and tour guide. Before we get into this episode, I have an update. It's with immense sorrow that I share that one of the guests featured in this episode, Rachel New, passed away due to cancer. She transitioned peacefully in her sleep the evening of December 12, 2020. She was 43 years old and is survived by her mother and seven-year-old daughter. Rachel's passing was unexpected. Although she was diagnosed with cancer in fall 2019, Rachel went into remission early in 2020. I remember hosting a virtual gathering in April of that year, the first time we met as a group of mentor coaches after the global pandemic was declared. I and the other mentor coaches who are featured in this episode marveled at how happy Rachel looked. Her hair had grown back and she was feeling upbeat about her health. Sadly, six months later, towards the end of October 2020, Rachel found out that the cancer had returned. She would be released and admitted to hospital a couple more times before being admitted to hospice care. A week later, Rachel transitioned peacefully in her sleep. When you hear Rachel in this episode, you'll hear a woman who is passionate about creating a future without bias. Not only did she stand up against systemic racism and systemic poverty, But Rachel was also passionate about helping moms find solace, safety, and support in communion with each other. As an only child, Rachel was the fourth generation of women in her lineage to experience mother loss in childhood. While I'm saddened that Rachel's daughter is now the fifth generation to experience mother loss in childhood, Rachel left behind a community so that her daughter would have maternal support, even though Rachel is no longer here. As we transition into the introduction of this episode, and then the conversation with the mentor coaches, I want to remind you that the work of exploring unconscious biases cannot be done alone. I mean, yes, you'll need to do the stream of consciousness writing along with the guided prompts by yourself, but in order for this work to be sustainable, you'll need to ground yourself in a community for support and sustenance. In one of my last conversations with Rachel, about two days before she passed away, she shared that had it not been for the work she did inside my community on Patreon, she would have never been able to spot the destructive generational patterns plaguing her maternal line. Had it not been for community, she would have never been able to forgive her mom for abandoning her. And in fact, One of the last conversations she had before she passed on was a conversation with her mother, someone that she hadn't seen in many, many years, and she was able to make peace with her mom. And Rachel also shared that had it not been for the community on Patreon and all the work that she did using the guided prompts, that she would have never been able to trust other women so that she could leave a better legacy for her daughter. I miss my friend. And I'm thankful that whenever I want to hear her voice, I can listen to this episode. I trust that as you listen to this conversation, you'll be reminded that it takes just one person to become a better ancestor. There's a quote that comes to mind that says, it's up to us to break destructive generational patterns. When they say it runs in the family, you tell them this is where it runs out. That's what being a better ancestor is all about. This interview was recorded in October 2020, two weeks before Rachel found out that cancer had returned. Here's my introduction to the episode. In this episode, I have brought together the women who support my work in a much more deeper way. I do have my patrons in my community on Patreon who are going through the work and using the guided prompts and stream of consciousness writing in order to explore their unconscious biases. But as you can imagine, trying to hold space for hundreds and hundreds of people 
who show up in my community on Patreon would be utterly exhausting. And so there are four women, they all use the pronouns she, her, and they support my work in a deeper way. They are Oni Marchbanks, Annika Coleman, Rachel New, and Miriam Hall. And they've been able to join my inner circle through a certification process. This certification process is only open to patrons. And the reason being is because it's important that you're actually doing the work if you're going to hold space in a room for other people to do the work. It's entirely out of integrity and disingenuous to try to hold space in a room for people to unpack their unconscious biases using guided prompts and stream of consciousness writing if you yourself have not gone through the exercise yourself. And I've seen where people will try to do that and will create immense harm in the room. And so the certification process is open only to patrons. They have to fill out an application. Then they have to show up for the interview. And then based on the interview, a short list is created. And whoever has made the short list is sent an invitation to enroll in the program. Once in, they go through training and then the rest of their certification time is spent applying what they've learned to their workshop spaces. You see, anyone can take the writing prompts and they will soon be published in a workbook and you can hold space for people in rooms, in boardrooms, amongst your colleagues and so on. But what people are not skilled at is how not to create The power dynamics which exist in our society, created by the dominant culture, and avoid creating that same power dynamic inside your workshop space. If you're not skilled in how to do that, you will create harm for those who are marginalized and oppressed who show up in your room. And I know you're well meaning, you go online, you search things out. Maybe you buy my workbook when it becomes available and you take that into your corporations, your communities, and so on. And you're well meaning. But unless you also have the skill set in how to facilitate that space and facilitate it in such a way where you use decolonized practices, then yes, you're going to create the same power dynamics that exist. And instead of helping people bust through their unconscious biases, you only entrench it even deeper. So what's interesting about the certification process is that it's rigorous, it's long, and not everyone survives to the end. And partly because as people go through it, whatever they were not honest about actually becomes illuminated, sort of like the pandemic. (laughs) Whatever you are struggling with as a company, as a business, as a family prior to the pandemic, it only got worse because the pandemic shined a light on the problem. And so the same is true with the certification process. If you are someone who said that you're using reflective writing, stream of consciousness writing, and guided prompts to bust through your unconscious biases, and you sign up for certification, then you are going to be found out if you stop or you have never done that process in the first place. And so as a result, some who started the certification process did not make it to the end. But the four women I mentioned, Miriam Hall, Oni Marchbanks, Rachel New, and Annika Komen, they were the ones who were not only doing their own introspection and contemplative practices, but they were the ones who were able to not only reach the end of the certification process, but When the pandemic happened and I needed their help, they stepped up to join me on that journey to continue to provide and hold space for those who are exploring their unconscious biases. The certification process will open again. And based on the first cycle, we have made quite a number of improvements. Only patrons will know when the certification process opens. So if you're interested, you would need to become a patron and go through the inner field trip a few times so that you are ready to apply for certification. In the meantime, listen to this interview or panel discussion between myself and Oni and Annika and Rachel and Miriam. 
we focus in on the process of using contemplative practices in order to unpack unconscious biases. You're going to enjoy the different perspectives that we all bring to the table. Although we're using contemplative practices in order to unpack our unconscious biases, we each have different takes on the process. Each of the women that you're going to hear from also have a particular expertise when it comes to using introspective and reflective tools to unpack unconscious biases. And so I often rely on each of them around their area of expertise in helping me to make sense of some of the things that I see when I'm facilitating. I lean on their wisdom a lot and they lean on mine. And so they've gone from being certified professionals to mentor coaches and their roles are expanding as I continue to build out the certification program. We will also be sharing with you some of the things that happen and some of the things that we have observed, not only through the patrons in the community on Patreon, but also in our own workshops. Things such as what happens after you go through this process of unpacking. What can you expect? What should you plan for? And some strategies on how to navigate around that as you stumble bravely. If you'd like to read a detailed bio about Miriam, Oni, Rachel, or Annika, I invite you to go to www.innerfieldtrip.com. Welcome, Annika and Oni and Rachel and Miriam. Hi. Hey. Hi. Hey. Hi. <laughs> so we are gathered here to talk about two things. One being the, the kind of defining what the inner work is and then understanding how we use contemplative practices and why that matters. And then some of the things that people tend to experience, because you've now worked with me closely for more than two years, first as a patron and then as a certified facilitator and now as a mentor coach, my goodness. But before we start opening that conversation, I would like to ask you a question I ask all guests, which is this, who informs your work? Who are your ancestors that you bring into your work with you every time you do this, every time you step into the world? I'm going to start with Oni. Hi. This is Oni. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And that's a loaded question. So I was trying to think, who influences the work that I do and in what ways do they influence me? And I just couldn't come up with one person. I don't have one specific person that influences my work. I mean, I draw strength and courage from so many people living and ones that have gone on. But if you're pushing against uh, systemic racism and fighting for racial and social justice, the more power to you. I'm with you. Thank you. Thank you, Oni. And Oni, you are the mother of how many? Seven. Four boys and three girls. And grandmother to how many? Oh, I had number um, 15 and 16 is coming in two weeks. So. Goodness. (laughs) Girl, my hat's off to you. Thank you. And so that's why it's so important for you to be a better ancestor, yes? Yes. They are my why. I am hoping, and remember, hope is a beautiful thing. Their fight will look different, and we won't be fighting for the same things when they get to a place where they're trying to make sense of this so crazy world, right? That's what motivates me, is to get up every morning and to fight for their world. Miriam, Miriam Hall, no relation as far as we know. (laughs) (laughs) This question to you. (laughs) <laughs> your ancestors, both living and passed on, ideological, familial. Yeah, so I'm Miriam Hall. Um, I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I live in Madison, Wisconsin, which is Ho-Chunk land. Still is Ho-Chunk land. And like Oni, it's hard to pin down one, but what came to me this morning was it felt like it was important to name two streams, and one stream is the writing stream that I really learned from my mother and her father, so Trisha and Glenn, that I was a writer, that I could write, that writing was important, that it was valuable, and personal writing was valuable. And I feel very lucky in the last few years to have done research to find that I have a couple of 
people who I'd identify as race traitors in my father's lineage, who on the brink of the Civil War, Amos and Austin Hall, a couple of brothers, ran off a slave owner, and he came back and tried to kill them the next day, and they survived. So when I read the news articles about them, I just felt this chill in my bones. I am sure there are slave owners in my lineage as well. I don't deny them. And I also feel so inspired by that somewhere in my bones and blood. So I think of them a lot. And I think of Adrienne Marie Brown and Grace Lee Boggs a lot and the quality of what Adrienne Marie Brown calls emergent strategy. So not just what are we trying to stop, but what do we actually want to create and the importance of imagining another world or worlds that we want to be a better ancestor for. I don't have children. I have nieces and nephews, and I have lots of students and clients I work with, and I hope to spread not just the absence of oppression, but also the presence of joy and honoring. Annika, same question to you. Okay, thanks, Lisa. Yeah, this is Annika Komen, she, her, hers. I'm here today in Bend, Oregon, on the land of the Warm Springs Indian tribe. And when this question came, when you said you were going to ask us this question, I noticed like my mind swirling that the one ancestor that keeps saying like, pick me, pick me, is my grandmother, Cleo Bales. Some of the things about her that feel like inform me, she was an artist and a painter. She was a seamstress. She often had like spiritual visions and deep spiritual intuition and guidance. So much so that I think when she was about my age, I'm 52, some of the family around her from what she was saying and speaking thought she was crazy. And she actually went and had electric shock therapy, which I think back then was very violent towards the body and the soul. And so she reminds me that sometimes what we see and what we know, what we're standing for, even people close to us and around us might not understand and see, but keep standing in that. I think about her too. My grandfather was gone fighting in a war for four years and she was pregnant when he left. And so she raised my mother during the Great Depression and In that time, she bought a home. She was a beautician. She took care of her sisters and her family. She volunteered. So I just think about what she needed to draw on as far as strength and courage and capacity during that time. And then also knowing that when my grandfather came home, a colonel in the army, that she gave up a lot of her power and a lot of her voice to kind of, I guess, succumb to white male power and whatever safety or security she saw there. And I see that pattern in myself, in my past. So there's so many parts of her that feel alive in me, both the strength and resiliency and the creativity and also the challenge and the shadows that I need to work with to show up. So thank you. And Rachel, same question to you. I'm Rachel New. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I live in Southeast Florida on Seminole land. And like Miriam, one of my inspirations is Adrienne Marie Brown for her focus on hope and creation of what we want to see. And I heard in one of her podcasts with her sister, an interview of Miriam Kaba, who was an abolitionist. And I'm probably going to botch the quote, but she said something that stopped me in my tracks, something to the effect that no one enters harm having committed it. And it really touches on my feelings and beliefs about transformative justice and inspires me. I'm reading as part of a dual program that I'm in, Revolutionary Mothering, and that is extremely inspiring to me as a mom of a seven-year-old daughter. Speaking of which, my daughter is the fourth only child in a row on my mother's side. And in each generation, since my great-grandmother, from me through my great-grandmother, there has been mother loss during childhood. 
and I am trying to interrupt that pattern. And I'm battling breast cancer and trying very hard to ensure that that gets interrupted. And in doing so, I'm wanting my daughter to have strong women who, if anything should happen to me, should be able to surround her and support her in the ways that I would want her to be supported. And I want that for every child, especially those who lose parents to violence too early. And that is a strong inspiration to me. I appreciate hearing the complexity and the nuance of your lineages, both um, the commemoration of those that you shared biology with and those whose work inspires you. So thank you for sharing that. Now, one of the questions I have is around this work that we do. And there's this call often about do the inner work, do the inner work. (laughs) But sometimes people are often confused. Like, what does that really mean? And so when it comes to the practices that we use, contemplative practices, before you've met me, you've been doing this work. So what does doing the inner work look like when it comes to unpacking unconscious biases? What are some of the tools that you've used in the past and currently in order to make that happen? And how can we remove that confusion around, well, what's the inner work? This is Miriam. I'll offer something, Lisa, for that. One of the things that stays with me again and again in our current field trip and in the experiences I've had in your community and also in teaching contemplative writing and photography and meditation for many years is the role of what I call questions without answers. Even if a question has an answer, try not answering it, try leaving it open. And it's so powerful to notice when I go inside and really try to ask What's happening inside of myself? What's somatically happening, coming up in my body, my psyche, my relationships, my interpersonal relationships? What's happening there? I often actually leave more with a sense of mystery and not knowing, but also, and also a more of an ease and a relaxation around not knowing, not knowing for sure why. A quality of both and, as Oni and I were talking about earlier, both and rather than either or. And that quality is so uncomfortable at first to encounter, which is why I think a lot of people back away from the inner work. Besides the topics themselves being tricky, there's also this discomfort with not knowing and a preference for feeling like we know the answers. And it is also the most essential thing being able to stay with those questions and write a whole bunch and realize you have more questions when you end than when you begin. And finding some ability to be with that outside of the duality of answers into the power of paradox. I love that. I love that. And I believe that fully. Believe that fully. And the report written by Tema Alcon about the characteristics of white supremacy culture is one that really pinpoints those 15 characteristics of both and, and uh, or sorry, one of the characteristics is urgency and the other one is either or. And so you raising that this is a process where there's questions often without answers and that there's a sense of mystery, a curiosity that we should lead with when approaching this work is very key, very key, Miriam. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Annika and Oni, I know that both of you have done workshops before meeting me. And so out of that experience, how would you define what the inner work is? Well, as Oni would say, (laughs) right, Oni Messi. (laughs) Go ahead, Oni. I'll follow you. You know, I almost don't even know where to begin, but I'll give it a good try. What comes to my heart is uh, soul work. That inner work is the soul work. All too often, what I have witnessed and experienced with myself is that I thought that I had to be running around running around doing something, disrupting and dismantling systems and always doing something to be busy in the work. And I thought that's how the work was done. And I realized that that wasn't true. I realized that there was some, there are ways in which I had been harmed. The work I was, I was attempting to unravel, the work that I was attempting to disrupt. And I was either going to begin to do my inner work. And when I say the inner work, I was going to begin to honor my presence, honor my 
my voice, honor my anger, honor my presence. I wasn't going to last in this work. And someone told me, only if you don't learn to rest, if you don't learn to take care of yourself, this work will kill you. And I was like, yeah, I'm getting enough sleep. Yeah, I'm doing that. And literally at the murder of George Floyd during pandemic and something happened in my body that I really thought that I was going to not make it. And because I had built a community of people and I had started doing some work, some inner work, addressing my own trauma, my own internalized ways in which I've been oppressed and harmed. I was able to seek out my own self-care and honor that process and that, and to honor that it was necessary. It was necessary to say no. It was necessary to rest. It was necessary to know that I'm okay if, if I can't be at every protest, if I can't be at every board meeting. And honoring what my experience is and honoring how much I can give to this work. And that was hard for me. But because I had stopped, dropped, and said, what does my heart say? Uh, And honoring that space that says, you are enough, you are doing enough, and it is enough. And just sticking with it when I feel like there's so much to be done. I need to be doing it. So just being enough. And the way that this work impacts, especially those of African descent, and also indigenous people, there's a difference between how it impacts those of European descent and even other cultures. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate, Oni, you sharing that and sharing what that looks like and how that is triggered for especially African-Americans and the wider African community. Is there anything else you want to add about that experience? I know that you have done some work and Why is it that so many of us, and I say us as a person of African descent, you're a person of African descent, why is it that so many of us do not seek out that help? Why are we muscling through? One reason, I believe, is that we have these generational practices that have been passed down from generation to generation. And one of them is exhaustion. I know I can speak with my mother taking care of the family and and the husband and the bills and and, in the house and the yard and just being totally exhausted with losing and she lost her identity and caring for everyone else. And as an African-American, as a Black woman, I know I was just surviving, learning how to survive. Get up, go to work, make sure the kids have food, make sure the clothes are washed, and then you go to sleep, get up and go to work and not really thriving, not learning how to nourish your own inner self and doing the things that you like to do because there's so much to be done. Me as a priority and us as a priority, we tend to put ourselves down on the list because what's being black when you have a whole world of racism to fight because you are black, right? And you have to balance those things that they're parallel to each other and not and not in the absence of one another. So learn surviving. We aren't learning to survive and having to getting in the mindset to get out of that mode of just surviving. And there's no way that one can do their best work if they're in that survival mode. I once posted a question to Black, Indigenous, and people of color on Instagram asking, what would you be able to create if you weren't struggling for your survival every day? And the responses were, wow, deep, emotional, brought me to tears. Yeah. How much is being missed and taken because all we're doing is fighting for survival. No wonder great things aren't created from oppressed people at times. Because if we're fighting to just be seen as human, how then can we explore the fullness of our humanity? Right. Agreed. And so, Anika, you have taught me a lot about the way that the culture of white supremacy lives in the bones and nervous system. And so Oni has given a perspective around how that shows up as a person of African descent And so, Annika, can you share more about how that shows up for those of European descent and why Mm -hmm. it's so difficult to do the inner work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm so with Oni's share, just taking it all in and remembering interactions between Oni and I, where I came to her place of business and knocked on the door and we were out on the sidewalk and having this conversation about her care. In some ways, me doing a bit of an intervention and just the look on your face, Oni 
when I was speaking to possibilities of care that are afforded to me as a white woman that are just natural. White women get to take care of ourselves in this way. But you were looking at me like I was from another planet and yet we stayed with it. And I think there's something to that in relationship with white folks and or at least between Oni and I, where there's things that I've supported her with and things she supported me with. And that's just one of the possibilities when we're all doing our inner work. One of the things that I've noticed with myself and with other white folks is that the white supremacy really takes us out of our bodies, of our hearts, of relationship to ourselves and to each other and to the planet. And when I think about that, I'm like, how else could we do the things that we've done going 300, 400 years back and the violence that has continued to perpetuate itself and be passed down through generations? And so it would take us being very disconnected and fragmented inside from our own souls, as Oni just said, and our own capacity to feel. So going into this work as white folks, you know, one of my biggest concerns often is that it just stays kind of in the cognitive realm, that we learn how to be anti-racist and we do our best still from a supremacy perspective to perform and perfect and be a good person, but never going into the muscles and the bones and the heart and the psyche to really start to metabolize and unwind how white supremacy has been conditioned from the womb and beyond that intergenerationally. And so when we use these writing prompts or we use any sort of mindfulness or capacity to look at what's going on within us, we'll get some insight, we'll get some answers. But the next piece is the feeling piece. And that's being willing, if we really want to change from the inside out in a place that has us show up without running those supremacy signatures and that are still self-serving that I was doing in my anti-racism work, we have to be able to feel disorientation about who we are, confusion, grief, anger, insecurity, all the things that I think whiteness covers up in white folks and in the system of white supremacy. There's a lot of material there and it's ongoing. It's not like, okay, we're going to feel this for a day or a month or a season. It's being willing to go into our bodies and be uncomfortable, to be sometimes uprooted, unsure, uncertain, full of grief or anger or confusion or anxiety. Ultimately, that's the outpicturing of doing these contemplative practices is it takes us into that territory and then we integrate. And then we find more of who we really are in alignment with our soul. And we can start to build relationships with communities of color, other marginalized communities that are real and rooted and not extractive and consumptive that are actually can move towards transformation. Yeah, I think that's what I have. (laughs) What you have is a lot. It reminds me of when we met in the various rooms when I did the multi-city tour. And this also explains why months later, I get people who sat in those rooms, were emotional, they either got angry, they were in tears. There's other physical things that show up. And people were apologizing to me. Sorry, I cried when I was in the workshop room in Madison. Or forgive me for getting mad or upset or angry when we were having that discussion in Portland. And I sit here and I'm just mystified because that's what's supposed to happen. Right. Yep. That's what's supposed to happen. The emotions are supposed to come out because the culture, white supremacy, the dominant culture, the system of oppression, whatever it's called, whatever terminology you use, it's all rooted in the same thing. It causes us to shut off our emotions. And so each of you here, Miriam, Annika, Oni, you've all done your inner work. And Rachel, I know that you have done this, that you're not just someone who's mentoring others going through the inner future process, but you're also someone who's gone through this process yourself and you continue to do so. What have you found in your own experience? Much of what I've found resonates very much with what Annika spoke of, which is when I initially sit down to write I run up against a numbness and these blocks that make me feel uncomfortable and 
make me feel like I don't have much to say or much to write about, or I don't want to do this right now. And then when I continue and I just sit with it and keep going and keep exploring and keep showing up to the questions, inevitably I end up unearthing layers that open up my humanity and remind me of my humanity. And I'm just reminded by how I'm so enculturated to tuck that away and numb it, to just hide it away. I drew a spiral as Annika was talking. I was thinking about the layers of an onion and I was thinking about how when you do this work, you're constantly circling back to the same spots over and over again, but at deeper layers. And when I think about my inspiration for prioritizing doing the inner work, I think about how when I was 13, I went to live with my grandparents, my maternal grandmother and her husband, and he was Jewish. I ended up becoming later on very fascinated with the Holocaust and interested in learning more about it. And obviously was horrified by it, obviously much less everything that our country has done. And I studied social psychology in college and learned about the power of obedience and how strong the orientation to it is in our country and how that kind of runs things under the system, so to speak, without our knowledge or really conscious awareness of it and how damaging that is and how that leads to the things that we're seeing today on a level that's so much deeper than who happens to be running a particular country and how banal those evil things can be when we don't look at the fact that we all are capable of both good and evil within us, each of us. And if we don't face that, then we're never going to get past all of these things. Very true. This is Lisa Renee Hall. I'm in conversation with Oni Marchbanks, Annika Komen, Miriam Hall, and Rachel New. These are the four women who are part of my inner circle. They started off as patrons in my community, moved to becoming certified facilitators, and after two years of working closely with me, are now my mentor coaches. And one of the things I wanted to talk about now is this concept of one of the traits of the culture of white supremacy is urgency, rushing, right? And I know you've seen it. I've seen it. People come into this community like, give me all the prompts right now. I'm going to do five of them on the weekend. And they're rushing through it. Oh my goodness, I missed out. And so I often like to say to patrons in the community and those that I work with is that you need to withdraw to recharge. Withdraw to recharge. That part of this process is slowing down. Oni, do you have anything to add to that? I know that you have a concept that you teach around this. Yeah. Sometimes this work is approached like it's something that needs to be done as opposed to something that you continually do. What I've learned is that the necessity of slowing down and allow the process to affect the heart and the soul as opposed to the mind is so important. When you get in a hurry and you aren't mindful of emotions that are present in the process, you miss a lot of good work and and individuals don't get to do a lot of good work if you don't learn to slow down. A lot of people think that we have four seasons, right? Now, I say we have six seasons, summer, winter, spring, and fall. Then you have a due season, that's D-O, and then you have another due season, which is D-U-E. So in the due season, there's a time for work. And then in the other due season, D-U-E, there's a time to receive. And in that receiving is in the slowing down. So there is seasons. There's seasons where you're really, really busy about this work. And then when it's time, if you're doing that soul work, if you slow down and you've dropped and you've integrated the process and the information into your gut, connected it with your soul, and began that messy unraveling part of what this work requires, it calls for that. Then you're in the DUE season. So gone are the days. We've got six seasons, folks. <laughs> six seasons. Six seasons. I love that. Love that. 
And Annika, you'd call us like, what's the word that you use? Integration. Integration. It's letting it land in the body, the bones, the nervous system, the heart, as Oni said, the psyche, and in the life. So we do this work, but we're connected in our relationships and in our workplaces and communities and churches and wherever else. And as we land in ourselves, we're also going to be landing in our relationships with others as well. And that takes time, like in some ways to reintroduce ourselves. Sometimes those relationships go away. Sometimes they need to transform. So there is anywhere we have this work connected to, that I can speak to it as myself as a white woman with a trauma background, with some attachment challenges, that I can get this work linked up with my value, with being good enough, with finally being able to rescue me from my own challenge. And anytime that I'm coming from a place of wanting to resolve something that belongs in me through this work, it feels performance, perfectionism, urgency, fast-paced. I'm doing it in a disconnected way. So while the world needs us to take a stand and show up, It also needs us at the same time, here we go, both and again, to watch our pace and to be honest with ourselves about what is actually driving our motivation in the work. So if I come from a motivation to try and finally be good enough and perfect myself in this work, then my intention is in the work and it's not going to do the job. So my intention is to heal myself to heal my relationships, to become a more conscious person of systems of oppression, to be an ally to Oni and her family and other communities of color, that's going to fuel the work. So I think that's really important. Notice what we're bringing as we engage this work. Yeah, there's a rush for uh, many who come into our world to be seen as one of the good ones. And part of the inner field trip process is the lack of validation as they are doing the writing prompts, sharing the reaction. And especially when we're doing the 10-day challenge, especially as Miriam and Rachel have been doing a lot of moderating, that it's a lot. It's a lot that comes rapidly in. And so if you are trying to replace one identity with another, you're trying to replace the identity of being seen as racist with now, oh, I want to be an ally then those are the people that fizzle and leave and, oh, it's too hard and so exhausted, are looking for the end. And Miriam, it's something that you have said, right? You don't just do 10 days and you're done. You don't just do one workshop and you're finished. Right, that's so great. And I really appreciate and loved hearing about Oni's seasons. And what struck me is like the season that doesn't exist in Oni's season list is done. There's no (laughs) done season. (laughs) until we're dead, you know, (laughs) maybe not even that, like hopefully the legacy lives on. And I am really struck by that because there's not a time when this work is done in our interior. And there's also not a time this work is done in the exterior. Like we can have hope. We were talking about hope before this recorded conversation, you know, and that hope, what did somebody say? Hope gives direction for pain. But my hope is not that I will be done or that this work will be done. My hope is more the healing right? Active process of healing, being in the healing. I don't even really think there's a complete healed, as in past tense, done now. And I've thought about this as a Buddhist, I think about too, instead of talking about let's be enlightened, it's more like let's continue to enlighten. It's an active process and a process that then needs rest, like Oni and Anarch are pointing to. And like you always point to, Lisa, you give people the weekend off, like take whatever your weekend is off. So you can integrate. And that is so essential because there's really no point of completion. And that quality of just really letting ourselves rest so we can continue and continue with heart and soul and wholeness is really essential. And that's the, I think a lot of, as I mentioned earlier, this quality of being stuck with more questions rather than answers. I think that's some of the same thing. It's like, I want to be done. I want to be marked as a good one, especially for white women. What are you marked as a good one? I want to be done with my racist identity. It's not going anywhere. We need to transform it, which Lisa, you've talked so wonderfully about. Can we actually transmute? Can we transform our inner oppressor? 
and find our guidance in that way. That's what we're actually doing. It doesn't feel as grounded as it does to be like, check, done. It's not about who we are as people. It's about the water that we're swimming in, the things that operate through us and will continue to operate through us if we are not aware of them and intentionally interrupting them over and over and over again, continually returning to that process. As I sit here, my heart's a little tender right now and jaw's kind of tight. As a Black woman, I hope that we can deconstruct the social construct of racism. I, I hope that we can end racism. That's, I really want to find a way in which 10, 15 years won't look like today, that we won't be still fighting systemic racism and that things, I hope that we can end it, that we can change it. And it's not that anymore. I really do believe, even when I'm resting, even in my dreams, I really do believe that. I really hope that my children and my grandchildren will have that same access and resources and opportunity. And I'm working very hard to create wealth disparities to address that so that I have something to have that's important to me. And Annika knows the conversation that I've had with her. And that's really important to me because that's one of the disparities and to address those things. I really believe that if we all work together, because together we rise. And if we work together and we keep having these conversations, that racism won't be here. We can change that because somebody made it up and then enforced the story and told the story and we bought into it. But I believe that we can deconstruct that. And we're doing that. This is what we're doing now. So call me foolish. (laughs) Thanks for bringing up the bar, Oni. I appreciate bringing up the bar. I don't think it's a dream that doesn't have ground underneath it, Oni. And here's why, in what I've learned in working with you, Lisa, and you, Oni, and Rachel, and Miriam, and, and also doing this work with others, is that as we learn the way of deconstructing white supremacy, racism, sexism, homophobia, you name it, within us, we've kind of got the code. When we do it in an embodied and true way, that's consistent, that has a rhythm and pace to it, that has focus and community support to it. We learn the code and then we can do it in our relationships and our communities. And we start to learn what's effective and what's not in bringing this work into our organizations, teams, communities. We know what actually really worked for us and we can share that. And we can start to move that into the fabric of our relationships close in personally and professionally. And we start to be able to have a systemic view, a systemic analysis, a waking view of the systems we're in. We can look at and zoom out and see in our companies, our organizations, our systems, what's happening uh, relationally, emotionally, racially we can start to have that same sort of awareness. This thing scales is what I would say. It's individual, it's relational, it's communal, it's organizational, it's corporate. And so we start to gain that capacity to have what they call a liberatory consciousness, coming to this ourselves and each other and our systems with a waking consciousness, with an analysis of what's happening, the capacity and the courage to take action, to try things, to mess up to iterate, adapt, get feedback. Gone are the days that we launch something that's perfect and gets it right. We're not going to do it. So we have to put something in play, right? And then listen and learn from the system and the voices and the people that know, that have pieces of the perspective and keep iterating and going back. Okay, now where are we at from a waking position of seeing our organizations? And that's from whatever position we find ourselves in, in culture right now. We have presence, we have power, we have voice, even if it's shaky, even if you feel insecure. And then there's some that don't, some leaders of organizations and companies that have tremendous power and influence. And the the beautiful thing is you have that and can transform your organization and, and start in big and small ways. The scary part it is that if you haven't done this work, 
then the shadow of your unconscious biases, racially, gender-wise, all around, are actually what's creating the culture. They have a stronger hold on the culture than any of your intentions or vision or mission statements. And as you begin to transform yourself as a leader, you start to almost like uh, inform the culture of what values and behaviors and ways of being together are accepted because you're modeling it. People feel you and watch you and you'll start to transform how you show up. And that's why it's so important that if you have platform, whether as a CEO, as an influencer, whatever language that is, that's why it's so critical that you are also, as Annika said, you're also participating in doing this work. It's not enough to send the intern to go off into the internet to research all the DEI people and put a list together and bring it to us so that the intern can meet their 40 hours or 200 hours for the summer. That's not enough. I can't tell you how many emails I get from someone who I go to the company website and I can't find that person's name, but yet they're tasked with asking me how much does it cost to run a workshop. But what is your CEO doing? What is the chairman of the board doing? Are they also going to participate? Is this being actioned by the C-level suite? And so if you have platform, you have a responsibility, as Annika has pointed out, to get involved in doing this work. Because if not, nothing changes. But then on the flip side, there are those who feel they don't have any power, either from a class status, either from a sexual orientation identity. I can go down the list of all the marginalized identities that someone might say, but I have my own oppression to be worried about. I can't be bothered also standing up for Black lives. When George Floyd was murdered and there was all this excitement, all this excitement, there was trauma that was being reproduced for those of African descent. Others were going around collecting anti-racists and anti-bias facilitators and educators like Pokemon chips. And then the result is that the Washington Redskins drops their mascot name. A lot of companies and brands dropped their racist characters on their products and services. And I mean, that isn't reforming the prison system. That isn't reforming police, but it is a step in the right direction. And what do the Washington Redskins have to do with Black Lives Matter? Not much. But if, as Rachel has pointed out, as Oni has pointed out, as Miriam has pointed out, Annika has pointed out, that all oppression is connected, then freedom for one is freedom for all. You know, I'm thinking about the George Floyd and the number of companies and organizations that came out with statements and some of the actions that have happened. And those are, are landed in real. I think there are some organizations that are taking a hard look at themselves or taking first steps. And that's good. And then it also reminds me of how it didn't take very long for white supremacy to come in and reinforce itself with the executive order of banning on diversity trainings of race and gender. And it speaks to me about how fortified, how deep this structure of whiteness runs and the kind of courage and fortitude and community and support that's necessary. And I think that's one of the call outs to leaders and organizations right now is there's so much influence and so much could happen if an organization starts to transform itself from the inside out and how that will impact employees, how will that impact their relationships with, I don't know, manufacturing lines and hiring and who gets promoted. And my hope is that the leaders of these organizations will get a taste of doing some of this work and feel the liberation that begins to happen on the other side, begin to find the identity outside of whiteness where we can actually settle and rest and show up with integrity and sovereignty and solidarity in this work. And I think once there's a taste that it's not just for Black lives, it's not just for Native lives, it's not just for women, that actually we all have a stake in this liberation and this healing. There's nobody that hasn't been impacted to some degree by whiteness. Even those that have tremendous privilege, think of the lack of soul, and the lack of connection to the heart and what that robs. There's differences in what whiteness takes from us all. And I just feel like it's so important to call us into 
the long game work of dismantling this and realize that we all have a stake in it. We all have a stake in it. So the emotions, they're real. The grief, the loneliness, isolation, the anger, slowing down and letting it marinate is also key. Understanding something I like to say that patrons have really embraced is to stumble bravely. And they've been using that as a farewell. Off I go to stumble bravely. And so that's all part of this process. If someone listening says, yeah, I kind of get it. What would be the last message that you would want to leave with them? And Miriam, I'll start with you. I mean, it sounds kind of scary. Like, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose things. Trauma's going to come up. Oh no. What would your message be to them? Yeah, I've just been sitting with a lot of grief after really feeling Oni's response saying, I want it to be done. I hope it's going to be done. This is what I'm working for. And just really feeling how I tend to get subsumed in grief and lose that bigger hope. And um, I said, thank you for bringing it up, bringing the bar up. It's just so, I think that's really, it's essential that we work together because each of us are going to have time when we just feel like, is this ever going to change? <laughs> or how is it going to change? Or is it ever going to be done? And, and need each other to pull up. And sometimes I'm that person for someone else. And sometimes someone is that for me. So this the way that you run a community, Lisa, that you've really, you've trained us and we've worked together as a community. I always feel so buoyed after our conversations, including this one. And also there's still that grief. But that essential quality in the community that's really shining right now where people are holding each other up and not essentializing, like you had this experience, ergo, you are racist, ergo, that's it. Not condemning our world, our society, and not condemning each other. And that transformative justice that Rachel was speaking of that comes so clean in the contemplative process while also being messy. It's just really the doing it together. I just really thank all of you for doing this together with me and with each other and with the patrons and the community and all the work you do. Rachel, what advice would you give someone who's like, "Eh, I'm going to lose things, I'm going to lose my identity, I'm going to lose my power? What advice would you have for them? I was thinking about a newsletter that I received from Kelly Deals talking about the dopamine hit that people get from dominance and how intoxicating that can be for a lot of people. When you're in an organization, you're in a hierarchy. There is inherently going to be that dominance dynamic inherently involved in that. And if you want to change things, we have to make the rising together irresistible. We have to address the fact that under hierarchy, the onus tends to be on those at the lower end of things to take the greatest amount of accountability with the least amount of power. And we can't change things that way. We need the leaders to take responsibility for being the examples for how to take accountability and transform our relationship to that. I I love what you just said, Rachel, like make it irresistible, make it sexy, make it fun, make it creative, bring art as Oni and I do, bring music and dance. And I know without a doubt, speaking as a white woman, the place where whiteness occupied my being, as I metabolize that, as I heal that, I get to find more of who is Annika essentially who's Annika as a soul, what's important to me. And that is priceless. That's worth every single heartbreak or loss or moment of confusion to continue to find that ground of myself that is actually shared with Oni, Rachel, Lisa, Miriam, all of y'all. It's a place where we can stand on and actually move this not so pipe dream of a dream forward that there'd be liberation for us all. Liberation for us all. And Oni, last word. My liberation is connected to your liberation. I forget who said that, but it just rang true for me that I'm not alone and we can get free together. Now make the rising together irresistible. Thank you so much, Rachel. I'm going to use that. Thank you. Going forward. If a person comes to me and says, I'm done, I've got these tools, I am aware of what I need to do. 
I will say to them, done is not a season. Remember, there's summer, winter, spring, and fall, due season, D-O, D-U-E, not D-O-N-E. So you don't get to be done because it's, remember, and I often remind individuals that it's a journey. It's a lifestyle. It's for the rest of your life. If you are connecting with my liberation and our liberation is connected together in solidarity, then we're not done. And even when we rest on this side, I'll see you on the other side. Drinking margaritas in a rocking chair, right? <laughs> right, absolutely. We've got a plan, you got a date. <laughs> We're continuing into the afterlife. Keep living, keep giving, keep reaching. Ah, uh, there's my son. Keep reaching. There's always a place where you can reach for someone and something. Brilliant, brilliant. As I was saying and sharing with you, as we come to a close, I was sharing this, watching an episode of Star Trek Discovery. I mean, anytime I can bring Star Trek into a conversation, I will. And this is one of those moments. And so the conversation was about the disappearance of the Federation, which is the coalition of planets. And anyways, it might be Greek to some of you. So one of the last messages was around one of the characters said about hope that I continue to stand for the Federation in hopes that it comes back together, because if I don't have hope, what else do I have? And I know that hope can seem like a privilege, especially when you're in the situation dealing with it. But if we don't cling to hope that there is a better day, then there's another extreme. And we see that come out with some individuals who believe that it's going to take guns and take a revolt, a race riot in order to see a new day. But what makes us different from that is that our new day involves everyone. And as each of you have have pointed out in what you said, that if we cannot come together to strive for what this new day looks like, then yes, we are going to be mired in this misery and suffering. And so I'm encouraged by you, Miriam, Oni, Rachel, Annika, and I'm so thankful that you're in my circle. I had it shared in the introduction that Our relationship was extended because of the pandemic. And my goodness, I don't think I would have been able to survive it without each of you in my inner circle. We hold each other. And this is representative of what the new day looks like. And I'm so thankful for each of you. As I close, I was in conversation with Oni Marchbanks, Anika Komen, Miriam Hall, and Rachel New. You can find out more about these four beautiful, amazing souls by going to innerfieldtrip.com. I'll lead you to their bios. You can find out more about their programs and engage with them. Just look for episode eight. My name is Lisa Renee Hall. Stumble bravely.